Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is not the entire uh, Old Testament reading. It's Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. You've heard the expression, preaching to the choir. And what that means is that a person repeatedly speaks things to an individual or to people who already know it all. It'd be like going to a health spa or a gymnasium where people are working out. And you'll say, attention, you need to exercise, it's good for you. Well, the people are already exercising. Well, this morning we're speaking about worship. We're speaking to people who are here worshiping the Lord. And many of you come here Sunday after Sunday to worship. Isn't it like preaching to the choir? Well, it's true, we need always a good choir. And musically, we do have one. But also, we need to, again and again, hear some of the fundamentals of worship. So I've titled this message, Worship 101. We'll look at who, how, and why. Now, because of the press of time, we're not able to really go uh, real deep into things. In fact, one of the building committee chairmen or building committee members said to me, Pastor, just five minutes this morning. <laughs> I think it was teasing. Uh, now, it really is quite something when you think about it. That our Lord Jesus Christ even allows us to worship. That's special. But I want you to take a look at who to worship. Of course, there is a God. There's no excuse for the atheist. The world about us, and all of its order, from big things to small things, shows there's a supreme being. Thinking this world came into existence all by itself would be like thinking this new building almost finished came into existence all by itself. And if we give it a little more time, it'll finish the job. Also, uh, the Lord states, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies show his handiwork. But also, there's another way uh, all people can know there's a God. Not only the voice from outside of us, the world, but also the voice within us that says there's a God. And that's why the Bible in many places, calls the atheist a fool. Now, it's the Bible that tells us who the supreme being, who the true God is. He's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God. And he says to us, you shall have no other gods besides me. And when Satan was tempting Jesus to bow down before him, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so God has to be number one in life. Whatever is first in your life really is your God. And from time to time in our lives, maybe we allow something else to be first in our life. It could be intelligence, as the epistle reading stated. But often it's that God that's spelled with one letter, the letter I. Two letters, me. I'll do what I want to do, when I want to do it, if I want to do it. It's like singing... Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. Another God, there's many, uh, could be things like popularity, our looks, our house, our job. Could be money. And you think money, what, what a tremendous gift it is from God. We need money to, to live. Uh, we need income to purchase things. 
We use money to worship our Lord through our offerings. But we are to master our money rather than letting money master us. It's a gift from the Lord. It's not to be number one. I'm also going to speak about sports for a second. I love sports. I think many of us just love sports. It's a great thing. This is not a tirade against sports or bashing in any way. Let's think of our, of our metro area as far as sports. It seems it's unlike any other metro area. Could be mistaken there. Let's think of the things going on here. A team from every major sports league. Spring training here. Half the major league baseball teams train here. 2023 had the Super Bowl here. And then, of course, the World Series. We have this here, the Final Four. We have a major golf tournament. In our congregation, Arizona State athletic programs close by. We have coaches and participants in sports who worship with us very regularly. We have athletes in our congregation who received athletic college scholarships. You might say the ASU starting quarterback attends our service. A field goal kicker some years back who kicked the winning field goal against the U of A is here in our congregation. Seven from our congregation have run into Boston Marathon. Our girls' grade school basketball team were consolation yesterday in the tournament. Our boys' basketball team, it's to no surprise, won the championship. And so I love sports. I participate in them. It's just, you can't let them be God. I'm an avid Green Bay Packer fan, as some of you are, and no yang and booing now. But keep them in place. Enjoy them, participate in them. Remember, God's number one. It's always great to see Christian athletes uh, come and worshiping the Lord, knowing he is the number one person and the number one thing in life. And as the commandments tell us in the definition, we should fear and love God that we do this or do that. Or the first commandment, definition, fear and love and trust in God above all things. So, worship 101, who are God. How? Well, many things could be said here, but we'll look briefly I read the two major ones. One is by going to church to worship. So important is that, that there is a separate commandment in regard to that. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Another place in the Bible which states, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. When God gave the third commandment, it was not his purpose to make life miserable for us, must I go to church type of attitude, but actually he was giving it for our own benefit, for our blessing. We come to hear God's word which strengthens faith, preserves faith. We come to receive communion. Look at all the things God is giving us through worship. But also, we come to give worship to our Lord. The very fact that we are present, the fact that we participate in prayers and hymns and, and in our offerings, that's worship of our Lord. We do call our church services worship services. Indeed, they are. But worshiping God is not simply and only a Sunday thing. It's meant to be throughout the week. It's not one or the other. It's both and. It's obeying the laws that God has given to us. So the person who seeks to worship the Lord regularly also seeks to follow God's commandments. 
John wrote, this is love for God to obey his commandments, and his commands are not burdensome. So you're worshiping God in your everyday life. As we sing, take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. So, worship as we gather together. Worship in your everyday life. So the who, the how, and the why. Why obey? Why, why worship? Why obey God? Again, let's look at two things. The first one we speak about is respecting God. You know, God, right before he gave the commandments, used these words, I am the Lord your God. A mother told her 10-year-old boy, 10-year-old son, go clean your room. And the boy said they ignored her. And mom said again, hey, clean your room. And the boy just would not. So mother said the third time, go clean your room. And he sassingly said, why should I? And she said, I am your mother, I told you. Now, mothers have ever said things like that, fathers? I'm your mother, I told you. Well, there was no question whether this was his mother, but what she was doing was citing her authority to tell him what to do. And so when God says, I am the Lord your God, he's also citing his authority to tell us what to do. He's given us the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. And he's serious about this matter, and so should you. It's not like a pushover grandparent who gives grandchildren almost everything they want or lets them do everything they want to do. Now, God's not that way. He certainly is loving, but he's not a pushover. So he's serious about obedience, and he threatens to punish those who disobey. So don't ignore God or his commandments. But we are to obey not because, simply because we'd be afraid of any kind of punishment, although if we ignore God, that happens, we should fear, but mostly because of respect for the Lord. But the second one, and the very important one, is that we worship God because of love. And you think how the first words that God says when he gives the commandments shows that. I am the Lord your God. The word used here on your loving Lord. But also he goes on to say, I brought you out of Egypt where you were slaves. And so it was three months before Mount Sinai that God had parted the waters of the Red Sea and took the Israelite people out of slavery, and now they're going to the promised land. And God would take care of them, provide for them, make sure that water and food and so on. And then also from them would descend the Savior, Jesus Christ. God has this also wonderful love for you. He's blessed you throughout life. He's provided food and clothing and abilities and job and income, a house and so on. He's been good. And above all, he's provided you with forgiveness. Here we are, sinners that we are, and yet God has forgiven us. About 1,500 years later, after Mount Sinai, the Savior Jesus was born. And he kept all these Ten Commandments perfectly in thought, word, and deed. And he gave to us that perfection, that righteousness. And from us, he took our sins. And since sin must be punished, he took that punishment of his own sufferings and death on Calvary's cross. And his resurrection shows, indeed, our sins are forgiven. 
and we're on the way to the promised land of heaven itself. And that leads us in turn in love to obey him, to worship him in that way. Now, we're told that God is a jealous God, and that might be a little bit bothersome at first because we think of jealousy, which in most cases is a sin. But there is also actually a good type of jealousy, strange as it may seem. We have a faithful husband who loves his wife and is very kind and good to her, but she in turn uh, starts going out with another man. Well, he's not going to be indifferent to that, is he? At least I hope he wouldn't be. No, he's going to be upset and jealous. And so God is a jealous God. If we go astray from him, it's not good. If we go astray from him, we are ending up in hell. And God doesn't want that to happen. He loves us too much to allow that, to want that to happen. He doesn't simply say, so you're astray, see if I care, just go to hell. Not at all. He wants us to follow him and worship him. He has love for you and for me. And now, we looked at the who, we looked at the how and the why. And may our good Lord grant that we worship him and always say and do and think. I mentioned before what a great privilege it is for us sinners to come before the Lord and worship. But you know, the Lord has taken away our sins. So here we are as his children, as his saints, worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.